Your Honor, I'd like to reserve six minutes for rebuttal. Okay. Uh, good morning, judges. Uh, may it please the court, uh, Derek McGinnis on behalf of Wholesale Investments, LLC. Um, we're here on the review of a uh, trial court's denial of a motion to intervene. Um, by way of background, the underlying issue here was there was a case in which a third party with an unrecorded interest filed a lawsuit against uh, another party and recorded a list pendants against a piece of property. My client, Wholesale Investments, is the owner of that property and was the owner of record and in possession of the property at the time that the list pendants was recorded. My clients were they owner of record? They were not. There was an unrecorded. Well, they didn't interest. file title uh, yet. So. Excuse me, Your Honor. They hadn't filed the title yet. The deed. They recorded the deed. No, they had not, Your Honor. Um, what took place was on August 2, 2012, Wholesale Investments LLC purchased and took possession of the subject property from the previous owner. The title company was charged with recording the, the deed. Um, on August 10th of 2012, the plaintiffs in the underlying action recorded a notice of list pendants against the property. On August the 16th. The title company got around to recording the warranty deed, and my client was then the record title owner. Um, it wasn't until sometime in late December, early January, that my client found out about the lawsuit, um, at which time I was contacted, and we immediately filed a motion to intervene on behalf of my client. Um, the trial court denied the motion to intervene, and we immediately filed a motion for rehearing. Now, attached to that motion for rehearing was um, two affidavits of my client that stated that they were they took possession of the property on August 2nd on the day that they closed, um, that they had an unrecorded interest at the time that the list pendants was recorded. Um, and I believe that the trial court committed reversible error by not allowing the motion to intervene because Florida Statute Section 48.23 provides a special exception for parties in possession with an unrecorded interest for the 30-day bar. 48.23 provides that when a list pendant is recorded against the property, any party who wants to intervene has 30 days to do so. However, specifically accepted from that are people like my clients who have an unrecorded interest and are in possession of the property. Now, how do you get around the case law? Excuse me, Your Honor? Uh, the, the, the court, the trial court below, basically referred to the cases in Florida. And how do you get around, with your position that you're advocating, how do you get around I, the case law? I don't believe that the trial court referred to anything. The trial court simply submitted an order with one finding that the um, motion to intervene was untimely. And that perhaps at the hearing that was, uh, that was argued? Well, the only thing in the record your Honor, was my motion to intervene. The facts of this case are unrefuted. Um, opposing counsel never filed a, a memorandum in opposition. They, there was no transcript of the hearing. There was nothing to question the fact of whether or not my client was the record title holder and in possession of the property at the time the list pendants was recorded. Well, how did you demonstrate at the first hearing on your initial motion to intervene, how did you demonstrate that your client was in possession at that hearing? Um, if you look at the motion to intervene, Your Honor, um, attached to that was the motion to dismiss, which laid out the um, derailment of title. And attached to that motion and in the allegations, which are unrefuted, are the fact that if you look at the record on page 44, uh, paragraph 17, um, it alleges that wholesale investments um, took title and possession on August 2nd, 2012, before the Liz, Liz pendants was recorded. Additionally attached to that was um, the deed which was recorded, which shows that the date that the closing took place was August 2nd, the date that they took possession of the property and became the legal title holder, but perhaps not the record title holder. That was attached to the motion. The court overlooked that issue. We pointed but, that but the out August, to them. The August 2nd, August 2nd contract doesn't show they took possession, does it? It just simply says they, they bought the property. I think it's prima facie evidence. If you buy a property, the, the likelihood is that you're going to take possession of the property. Our allegations in our motion to intervene specifically say that we took possession of the property. That was unrefuted. Nobody questioned that. There was no affidavit in opposition. And we believe that the court, trial court overlooked that. Now, when we filed our motion for rehearing, we included the affidavits of Nancy and Nolan Crawford to show that they did take possession on August 2nd. And we were pointing out an issue to the court that you overlooked this issue. And the purpose of the motion for rehearing is for us to bring to the court's attention 
an issue that they may have overlooked. And this is the primary issue because this court specifically held in a case that was similar well, to this. Can I, can I interrupt you? Because you said it's unrefuted. I thought that was um, that the other side is having issue with some of the, the statements that you've brought out in the motion for rehearing. They are having issues, but they have filed nothing to dispute it. They filed no. When we filed our affidavits with our motion for rehearing, there was no affidavit filed in opposition that said, no, wait a minute, you were not in possession of this property. So the only evidence that the court has are our affidavits stating that Nolan and Nancy Crawford, the managing members of Wholesale Investments LLC, closed on August 2nd and took possession of that property on August 2nd. There's no argument to the, there is argument to the other side, but there's no evidence on that record. Um, there is no memorandum in opposition that disputes our allegations. And if you look at the allegations in favor of the moving party, they're taken as true. And our allegations specifically say we were in possession of the property on August 2nd, okay. six days prior to the recording of the Liz Pendens. Then let me ask you this, if I may. Okay. There's no dispute that at least it wasn't until the motion for rehearing that all these issues were brought up for the first time. That is not correct, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, they were brought up at the hearing um, on the motion to intervene. On the mo I mean, okay, now, what was in the motion to intervene? That you, Were there any type of uh, uh, sworn affidavits or anything that would support your client's position of entitlement to intervene? Was there any evidentiary things that would indicate that your client were, in fact, in possession to allow the court to allow you to intervene? The only thing that was in the record were the allegations of the motion to intervene and the attached uh, warranty deed that was recorded on August the 16th. Um, those, those, that is what we relied on. There's nothing in the rule that requires us to attach affidavits to a motion to intervene or provide evidence uh, to support our position on a motion to intervene. But had the allegations been refuted or a memorandum of opposition been um, laid out, perhaps we would have done so. But there was nothing to refute our allegations that we were in possession of the property and it's clear in the record that we made those allegations in our motion to intervene and the trial court overlooked that. And what we did when we filed our motion for rehearing was said, look, judge, you overlooked this one issue and here is the evidence that we're gonna put forward now so that you can correct this issue. Well, do, now, we, have a, do we have a transcript of the first hearing? We do not, Your Honor. Exactly. The only thing we have is the trial court. We know what the court considered because this is an abuse of discretion. Well, statement. and that's why I believe that this is, a, I don't believe it's, a, it's an abuse of discretion. We're, we're dealing with a question of law here. Okay, um, wait, wait, wait. Okay, now let's go back because I think okay. that's critical. Isn't our standard abuse of discretion right now? I don't believe that it is, Your Honor. Okay, well, um, where are the case? Then cite me to some cases that tells me that this is not our standard right now because I really think that's your biggest hurdle at this time. Okay. Um, generally speaking, Your Honor, um, when, when, you, when the court's reviewing an order denying motion, I mean, it is usually an abuse of discretion. However, when you're only dealing with a question of law, um, then it goes to a de novo review, which is what happened in this case. Okay, so what is, okay, if I'm, and, and we're familiar with it, what is it about this being a question of law? Because there's no question of fact in, in play here, Your Honor. The, the, the facts of the matter are, the evidence on the record shows my client was in possession and had an unrecorded interest at the time that the Liz Pendens was recorded. And, and this is perhaps, maybe we don't see it in the same way. I thought your opponent is taking issue with that. They say that they're, they're taking issue with the fact whether or not your client is in possession because there's never been any at the outset, any affidavits, anything sworn indicating that your clients were in possession. No, of the there were affidavits, Your Honor. They were attached to the motion for rehearing. For that, but at, we're talking about the very, very outset, at the very, in your initial motion for to, in, for, to intervene. So now, okay, it's a two-step process. You were denied, you go through the case, you file the motion to intervene, the court denied it. Then, later on, you file a, a, a motion for rehearing, and for the first time, now you have all the documents, all the things, it's pretty much, it's almost like, finally all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and the court, at that point, when consider all that, that's where the standard review, I think, is critical. Isn't that, at that point, an abuse of discretion standard? I, I don't believe so, Your Honor. I believe that it's a, a de novo review because you're not, it's not a factual question. The, the, none of the allegations were refuted. So the allegations need to be looked at in the favor of the moving party. We're the moving party. We allege that we were in possession. No, nothing in opposition to that was ever filed or any denial of that was ever made on the record. 
Um, but those are those are allegations in a motion. That's not evidence. That, that's correct. So what evidence was taken the first hearing that the court uh, ignored? I would say the warranty deed, Your Honor. The warranty deed clearly shows that on August the second they closed and they took possession. The court could have taken judicial notice of that. It chose not to do that. And they could have said, okay, you were in possession of this on August 2nd, and you should be entitled to intervene. Since they were a third-party purchaser for value, the court would, should look at the totality of it and say, okay, and you were in possession. And that's the, the problem that we have because we have no transcript. We don't know what the court considered, what the court did not consider, whether that warranty deed was even valid or not valid, what was argued at that initial motion because we have nothing to review that. So I think we can't really, you have to look at from this step on in your motion for rehearing, because quite frankly, anyone could argue what was said or not said that clearly the record reflect that. We don't know. We don't I, know I what understand. was argued below. And I, what I would say, Your Honor, is that even if you, whether you go de novo review or you go abuse of discretion, I still think you come to the same answer. The trial court was committed reversible error. They were wrong in denying the motion to intervene. And this court has specifically held that um, Rule 1.530 is not limited to a mistake the court has made. To the contrary, rear hearing may be granted in an appropriate case to prevent an injustice. And denying wholesale investments motion to intervene at this point would be an injustice. Um, and that could be caused by an error or omission, even by one of his lawyers. If you were to say, you know what, Mr. McGinnis, you should have filed this affidavit at the initial motion to intervene, and you failed to do so, and that was an error by you. This court has consistently held that we have to look at that and we've got to overturn that because they're being prejudiced for maybe a mistake that somebody made. Now, I don't believe that the affidavits were required based on the, the record because the, the warranty deed and the allegations clearly lay out what our argument was. We were in possession of the property at the time that the list pendants was recorded and we had an unrecorded interest. Um, and I think the court should look at those affidavits which are permitted to be filed with a motion for rehearing and they are entitled to be heard on a motion for rehearing, as this court has consistently held um, in Fernandez v. Boivert, um, the third DCA said the same thing in AC Holdings v. McCarty, um, first DCA said the same thing in Fitzner v. Lifestyle Community Blood Centers, and it's a consistent against all the circuit courts of appeal that if the record shows that they were in possession at the time and they had an unrecorded interest, they should be allowed to be in, to intervene. There was a specific case directly on point um, that this second district court of appeal um, decided back in 1959, Fraley v. Maurer. In that case, the owner took title to the property and possession two hours before a complaint was filed and a Liz Pendens was recorded against the property. That owner didn't find out for several months down the road that the Liz Pendens had been recorded against the property and they moved to intervene. And this court said, you know what? They should be allowed to intervene because they had no idea that the list pendants had been filed. And I think the record is clear that here we're pointing out an error by the court. You overlooked the warranty deed and the allegations that they were in possession and you should have allowed them to intervene. So that's what we're asking the court to do. And I will save the rest for rebuttal. Okay, thank you. May it please the court, my name is Rebecca Bean. I'm here on behalf of the Apple Lee, which is Edwin and Delilah Ernest. Um, this is my first oral argument, so please excuse my nerves. Um, I would like to begin by talking a little bit about the equities that are at play in this case, so then I'll move through um, you know, the analysis that the court should go through in looking at both, um, or first I should say, the uh, order denying the motion to intervene and then the subsequent order denying the motion for rehearing. Um, so to begin, this was a, the trial court case was initially grounded on inequity. I mean, they were seeking, our client was seeking um, an equitable lien, a constructive trust count, and also um, unjust enrichment. What had happened was they had invested over $17,000 in the property for what they thought was going to be in exchange for an interest in the property. Um, that $17,000 was basically an aggregate of um, a, a $12,000 payment and 
also, you know, some sweat equity that they put into the property, repairs, labor, maintenance, those sort of things. So what happened is, is our client filed suit in the lower court, and of course we didn't name any of the other, you know, wholesale, the appellant in this case, because we didn't know, we had no constructive or actual notice that they were an owner of the property. Um, as opposing counsel just stated, they took title, or they purchased the property on August 2nd, but it wasn't until August 16th that they actually recorded the deed in public records, putting us on constructive notice that they were, um, they had purchased the property and gained title. And I think that it's really important that we weren't put on constructive notice of that, and also we arguably contend that they were not in possession of the property. And I would submit to the court that it's not just any type of possession that, that the appellant needs to be, uh, needs to show, but it has to be actual possession. Uh, they have to be in physical possession of the property. That's what puts um, someone on notice, constructive notice, of their ownership of the property when there's no recorded deed in the public records. And that's why there's this exception cut out in 4823 um, subsection 1D. Um, it wouldn't be fair for, to allow a person in possession of the property to intervene you know, more than 30 days out if, if the person bringing suit didn't know that, um, or was, wasn't on constructive notice that they were in possession of the property. But whether the court agrees with that or not, I'll submit to you that there's no evidence of possession regardless, whether it's act, actual or constructive. Well, um, section 48 does carve out that exception to possession. Right. And the case law uh, states analysis of a motion to intervene requires the trial court to first determine that the interest asserted is appropriate to support intervention. Now, if you allege in a pleading that you were in possession of that property before the filing of the notice of less pendants, is that enough to show that the interest asserted is appropriate to support intervention? Or does it require more? I'm not because, sure I understand because the question. Because the motion to intervene does allege in uh, paragraph 17 or so that that they were in possession of the property prior to the filing of the notice of less pendants. It alleges that, that they were in possession, but that's not, I would submit that that's not enough. You can't just what say. What else is required? They have, they, Yes, the, the statute carves out an exception for them, but you have to show, I am in possession of the property. If he would have attached an affidavit. What, what, how about counsel's argument that the warranty deed was attached? Is that sufficient? No, and I would port the, point the court to the case of Adhin. Um, it's in a footnote, but the, the court explicitly states that it's not, there the owner of the property owned 13 properties and the court pointed out in footnote two that even though you have ownership of the property, that's not sufficient to prove possession. Um, so I, I, they're not one and the same. So that's what, to answer, I guess, to follow up with Judge Sleet's question, at that very first motion to intervene, they allege that they possess, they're in possession of the property. Right. Okay. They've attached a warranty deed. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happened at the, tr at the, at the hearing because we have no transcript. We just have an order denying that. So I, to follow up with the question, what was it that council needed to do, at least in that initial motion? They, the appellant needed to attach affidavits to that, or, or some other form of competent evidence to that motion, establishing that they were in possession of the property before the uh, less pendants was filed, or recorded, I'm sorry. Um, and I would argue that it's, they couldn't even attach the affidavits that they attached to their motion for rehearing because it doesn't establish competent evidence. By just showing, or just saying blankly that, or blanketly that I'm in possession of the property, that's not sufficient. What type of possession? Who, this is a corporate or an LLC. Who took possession on behalf of your, of your LLC? Um, on what day? How, I mean, it's, 
Okay, well, let's, let's grant that at least at that first initial motion to intervene, perhaps they, they failed to do what they needed to do. And let's just say the court, because we don't know what happened, mm -hmm. that the order, it is what it is. When they file a mo the motion for rehearing, what is our review standard? Is it, he's taking the position <clears throat> that it's a de novo. Do you agree with that, or is it an abuse of discretion standard? I would absolutely say it's an abuse of discretion standard. Um, I, I mean, there's case law after case law stating that's an abuse of discretion standard. I don't, I mean, depending on what issue you're looking at, I, I don't even know what he's arguing, what issue should be revu reviewed de, de novo. Okay. Um, it, He's taking the position that the facts are undisputed, that they have possession of the property. You all did not attack that. And based on that, that it becomes that it was almost like the court should have granted their, 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 uh, their motion to, to intervene. And I would respond to that by, you know, picking up on something that you stated earlier. And that's the motion, the allegations in your motion, it's not a pleading. And it wasn't a verified motion. So the allegations, they're just allegations, they're not evidence. Okay, so which brings me then to the next question. Can they, can a party in a motion for rehearing for the very first time bring in what I said earlier that you cross your, 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 your T's, you dotted your I's for the first time now, they get it, they file the appropriate affidavits, they bring all that needed to do in the, in the motion for rehearing. Is that something that they could do for the very first time? Um, first of all, I would not say that they crossed their I's and dotted, or dotted their I's and crossed their T's, but putting that aside, to answer your question, I would say that the standard is, even in the cases that the appellant cites in his brief, um, if you look at all of those cases, the court basically says that you have to show some type of ed ed exigent circumstance or compelling circumstance of why you're raising this for the first time, why you didn't you know, present this evidence to the court at the initial hearing. Then the, it appears that the court also looks at, okay, was there such a circumstance present? And two, if it, was the evidence good enough? Would it have mattered? Would it have changed anything? And I would submit to you that it wouldn't because even if the court considered those affidavits, we don't know if, if the court did or did not because there's no transcript of the hearing, but even if the court did, it's not competent evidence. Just merely saying I'm in possession of the property, that's just a conclusion. And, and I think it's pretty established in Florida law that a conclusion is not competent evidence. You have to support it by factual evidence. Again, I, I would say that he needed to say who took possession of the property on behalf of the LLC, things like that. How they took possession. Did they just have the keys to the property or did they move in? I mean, if, if the court wants to, he also wants to, um, the appellant wants to rely on the warranty deed. Well, if you look at the warranty deed, there's a different address associated with the LLC. So they're definitely, I mean, no one's living there. That's not their primary, well, I guess I can't say that, but it's not their primary address. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. It did, it did, thank you. Um, and just to follow up, and we've kind of already discussed this, I'd really like to point out there is no transcript of these hearings. So there is a presumption of correctness with regard to both orders. Um, and, and all we can do is look at what I it's would consider a lack of evidence. Because I think when counsel first came to argue, we have two cases very similar, same issue, motion to intervene, and the other one had a transcript, and that's the one that I was looking at. So my first question to you, but I'm looking at a transcript, it was in your case. <laughs> Very oddly, two very similar cases motion to intervene on the same docket today. That's so that's the reason. Off. So you are correct. There is really no transcript at all here. Right. So the, the only thing the court has to go off of is the motion that was filed. And, and I w want to submit that the motion for, to, to intervene that was filed, it was one paragraph. And of course, it attached a motion to dismiss. And in that entire motion, there was one sentence, I think in, in maybe paragraph 17, that said, we took possession of the property on August 2nd. And that's it. There was no reference to the statute that they were relying on, that they wanted to fall within this exception um, you know, for persons in possession of the property without notice before the list, the list pendants is filed. Um, and then again, on their motion for rehearing, they didn't 
they didn't um, include any competent evidence, and they also didn't explain why they presented this evidence for the first time. Um, so on that, I would like to conclude by just saying that you know, we'd ask you to affirm the lower court um, you know, primarily based on the fact that there was just no competent evidence of record. Um, so there's no reason to uh, reverse. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, because that was one of the things that I wanted to ask you, and counsel raised it, and I want you to address that. In your motion for rehearing, I mean, quite frankly, here's how I see the case. You were not involved at the very first motion. If it, you were involved in the mo first motion to intervene, I would imagine you've had all the appropriate papers being filed at the very first initial one. So you get involved, and then you file the motion for rehearing. You have all of the information. Why didn't you raise, did you raise anything indicating why none of these documents were provided at the get-go on that very first motion to intervene? Well, um, just to correct you, I did file the initial motion to intervene. Oh, you did? You I did. did. All right. And I don't believe that there's a requirement for there to be an affidavit with the initial motion to intervene. The record on his face and the allegations, which again, we made the allegations. We're saying, hey, we're in possession. It's The burden's on them to refute those allegations. If they're, if they're saying, no, you weren't in possession, they never filed anything with the court disputing that. But now, I, I, I understand if, that there if was... I may, no, let me correct you, because you're saying, I want to intervene, I'm in possession. Don't you have to show the court, again, <laughs> we don't know what was presented to the, to, to the court below, but don't you have an obligation to say, listen, we are, this, we are in possession of this property. This is an exception to that, so we are entitled to intervene. Doesn't the burden really fall on you? to make that showing as opposed to simply make an allegation, oh, we have it, and have the other side try to refute it? But I think we put it in the record with a um, public record, which is recorded in the official records of Sarasota County, and the judge has the ability to take judicial notice of it. Um, that on its face is prima facie evidence that we were in possession of that property. Now, counsel wants to keep saying that the affidavits um, are not competent evidence. Last time I checked, affidavits are competent evidence. And the affidavit clearly states that wholesale investments took possession of the property. And again, it's unrefuted. And, and, if let, they me, wanted and to let me and let me go with this. I think that the affidavit, what you what you filed in the motion for rehearing were appropriate. But my concern is why wasn't all of this done at the outset? As opposed to in my mind, you for the very first time, now you raise all that in a motion for rehearing, and there's case law out there that indicate that you really can't for suddenly raise all of these new matters on a motion for rehearing. Why wasn't that done at the get-go? Well, they're not new matters, Your Honor. I think what we're, we're not raising new matters. Um, we're raising a matter that was already raised, that we were in possession. What we're doing is we're pointing out to the trial court, you overlooked this issue and you were wrong when you denied our motion to intervene. And the case law that is actually relevant is a second district court of appeal case, Cash and Carry versus Garcia. Um, and that specifically states that almost any additional evidence whether newly discovered or not, is sufficient for relief on a timely motion for rehearing. Here, we attached the affidavits that we felt would point out to the court, hey, look, we were in possession. The warranty deed shows that, the allegations show that, but if you need more, here's more, and here's what we're gonna give you. Based on this, you need to relook, take a second look, and see if that, that um, exception in 48.23 applies to us. And that's why I think this is a de novo review, because the allegations that we made, again, are unrefuted. There's nothing in the record that disputes any facts. So there's no factual issue in question here as to whether or not we were in possession. Had they filed an affidavit in opposition that said, no, they weren't in possession, then there would be a factual issue. This becomes a question of law. Whether or not um, the exception to 48.23 applies to Wholesale Investments LLC because they were a party in possession, which the evidence shows, and had an unrecorded interest and exceeded the 30-day bar. That's exactly what happened here. That's what the court should have looked at when we filed the motion for rehearing, and they should have considered the affidavits on the motion for rehearing. Now, whether they should have been filed with the initial motion to intervene, I don't think they needed to be just based on the, the prima facie evidence. However, if you want to look at it that way, 
and you want to say, you know what, Mr. McGinnis made a mistake, then you'd have to look at the cases that this court specifically decided and said that nobody should be prejudiced because of a mistake or an omission where an affidavit is left out. We need to look at that affidavit and then take a second look at the issue and say, does this apply? The trial court did not do that, and there's nothing in their order that says that they took into account the affidavits on the motion for rehearing, so I think they either overlooked them or ignored them. They should have looked at them, they should have recognized that we were in possession, and they should have granted the motion to intervene, or at a minimum, a motion for rehearing so that we could bring that issue to the court. They denied it summarily. There was no rehearing, and they said, we're not gonna grant this. Okay, our next case this morning is Tower Hill versus McKee.